I am most pleased to uh, welcome you and to tell the rest of you a bit about Mark Reisner and his evolution as a water guru for the West. Mark is a vigorous conservationist who speaks often and has written volumes. His landmark book, Cadillac Desert, chronicles the struggle for water in the American West and especially in California. It is filled with stories of intrigue and comment on the politics and environmental consequences of water's use and misuse. The book, Cadillac Desert, will be used to title Oregon Public Broadcasting's upcoming four-part series on water, which will prominently feature Mr. Reisner. Mark Reisner graduated from Earlham College in Indiana. His interest and expertise in Western water sagas was honed at the National Resource Defense Council in New York City during the seven years that he wrote and edited their publication. Despite his interest in Western waters, he'd never been to the West, so he moved to California, and with an Alicia Patterson Foundation Fellowship supporting him, he was able to write The Cadillac Desert. Mark has written three more books since Cadillac Desert, and he consistently prepares op-ed pieces for the national press. Today, he brings his expertise concerning the social and political aspects of environmental change to bear as he talks with us about the struggle for water in the Pacific Northwest and in the West in general. Please join me in welcoming Mark Reisner. Thanks, friend. It's always a uh, privilege to be invited to Oregon. Uh, as a Californian, that has special significance. Uh, I haven't even been told that I, when I have to leave yet. Um, but I want to talk to you, uh, I want to give you a, a brief sort of cosmic uh, overview of water and where, where we've come to today with this perennial subject. And I especially want to talk about what I consider to be the two most difficult water and even perhaps natural resources issues facing this country today, one up here and one down where I come from. Uh, I know this being the city club, I'm supposed to uh, talk about uh, matters affecting Portland, but uh, I'm not really going to do that at all. I had a, a conversation just yesterday with a reporter from the Napa Valley newspaper and he was, you know, calling me about the uh, Cadillac Desert series upcoming, and he knew nothing about water, nothing about the series, and uh, all he was interested in was what the relationship was to the Napa Valley. And I said, well, you know, it's uh, really, it's about the Colorado River and the struggles that Los Angeles uh, had with all the other, all of its neighbors over water and diversions. Uh, and he said, well, how's that related to the Napa Valley? <laughs> and uh, I said, it's also about, uh, you know, the Columbia River and these titanic battles they're having up there over salmon and hydroelectricity. And he said, well, how's that related to the Napa Valley? And I said, you know, uh, being a kind of an irritable person anyway, and this really was beginning to irritate me, uh, I said, you sound like, your, your newspaper sounds like the kind of newspaper that would have this kind of a headline. Three Napa residents slightly injured an earthquake that devastates Los Angeles. Uh, he didn't think that was very funny at all. <laughs> but uh, in any event, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit far afield here, and I, I beg your indulgence. <laughs> when I came to California in, in uh, 1979, um, to permanently to, to live, there was still serious talk about building an aqueduct to the Columbia River. Serious talk. You don't hear that kind of talk anymore, uh, even in California. It seems the only people who think that might happen are people up here in Portland. Uh, there was very serious talk about building big dams, uh, new dams, on whatever of California's rivers anybody could find that had not yet been dammed repeatedly. There was talk, serious talk, about uh, towing icebergs down from the Arctic Circle. There was talk about raising our biggest dam, and this may have been the most serious talk of all, Shasta Dam, by another two or three hundred feet, 
in order to double or triple the size of our biggest reservoir. All of that talk and thinking was informed by the feeling that you can never have enough water. You just can't. There's no such thing as, as enough water, let alone too much water, uh, especially in an, a semi-arid or arid region. Now, one of the reasons that all that talk has been quelled and one of the reasons we haven't really done anything new in the water business, at least not in the water development business, where we haven't built a single major new dam in those 17 or 18 years since I moved west, is because we somehow managed to get by without having done it. How we've done that is, is a little bit of a mystery, even to me. In California, we've added, since uh, I came out in the late 70s, about three times the current population of Oregon. And the irrigated uh, agricultural industry, which re represents about 10 million acres, is just where it was then. There were 10 million acres irrigated then. There are about 10 million acres irrigated today. Uh, we've even taken some water and begun to give it back to natural uh, uh, supplicants, if you will, salmon and wetlands and things like that. Uh, that now have a legal right to water they didn't have 20 years ago. Uh, and we've managed to get by, and we've even managed to get through uh, a major drought that we had in the late 80s and 90s, and I know affected this region too, uh, without any kind of uh, economic or social meltdown, which is what everybody was predicting back when. We've done that, I think, uh, in a couple ways. One is we've simply conserved water in the same way that we've conserved energy, oil. Um, the average automobile today, despite all the Lexus, uh, you know, giant Lexus Land Rover type things that you see rolling around, is about, uh, the, the average oil consumption, uh, excuse me, fuel mileage is about twice what it was back in the uh, early 70s, late 60s. And uh, the average air conditioner uses, I don't know, a fraction of the electricity it did back then. So we finally done, in the case of water, what we've done in the case of uh, energy resources. We've just managed to do the same jobs with a lot less. Uh, the average rice farmer in California uses 40% less water than he did back in the uh, mid-80s. Drip irrigation for example, which can reduce water consumption by about 80%, is now becoming not just a significant, but almost a prevalent source of irrigation or, or uh, irrigation technique throughout uh, a lot of California's most uh, valuable agricultural regions. Uh, so basically conservation has gotten us through at least uh, the last 15, 20 years. Uh, market forces have finally been allowed to uh, infiltrate the water sector. You know, it used to be that uh, it was illegal to sell water in California. If you were a federal farmer getting your water from the Central Valley Project, you subsidized water. Uh, and Los Angeles was desperate for more, and they were willing to pay you, a willing seller, uh, for some of your water right. It was illegal to sell that water. On the other hand, it was legal for irrigators in Idaho to dry up the Snake River at Milner Dam, completely dry it up. So there was, a, I think, a, a, a weird sort of thinking going on then, and there still is today to some degree, uh, affecting what you can and can't do with water. Water is not a market commodity in the West. We don't allow it to be that. Uh, it's, it's, it has theological overtones. It's the most precious resource we have in any kind of semi-arid environment. And so it's, it's difficult for market forces to actually operate in this sphere. But slowly, gradually, we're letting it happen. The way that Colorado is solving its water problems is it's letting water graduate or, or, or gravitate to its highest and best uses, at least in economic terms. Uh, it's coming out of low-value agriculture and it's going to Denver. Now that may be a terrible thing if you don't want to see Denver grow to you know, the size of Los, Los Angeles, which is what's happening. Um, but if you're an environmentalist and you have a choice between that and building more dams, uh, maybe you're going to opt 
for market forces rather than dams. In any event, that seems to be what, what's going on in a lot of uh, the Rocky Mountain states uh, and a lot of uh, uh, the Southwest as well. We're solving the water problem with market economics and redistribution. <clears throat> and how long that can go on is a good question. Uh, in theory, about 80 to 85 percent of all the water in most Western states is still used by irrigated agriculture. So uh, in Portland, uh, or in Oregon, uh, you could have Portland probably grow to a city the size of uh, Los Angeles or Mexico City uh -huh. simply by retiring some farmland in eastern Oregon and sending the water out here. Um, that, of course, isn't going to happen if you don't allow Californians to move here. So keep the Californians out. You won't be having to deal with that quandary. But I think it's, it's the wave, or it's the trend, the current trend that uh, is sort of solving our water situation in a de facto sense. We're not going out building dams. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. We're not doing anything really actively. Uh, but the problem is, in a, in a sense, solving itself. In two instances, though, I think we face uh, huge dilemmas connected to water. And as optimistic as I've become in some ways, these are, ones, these are dilemmas that are, to some degree, insoluble. <clears throat> I don't know how you can solve them, given what's at stake, given the goals that, that people have, and given the disruption and dislocation that might be caused achieving those goals. I'm not sure you can solve these uh, dilemmas to anybody's real satisfaction, but I think you have to make the effort anyway. And uh, the ones I refer to specifically are the salmon situation up here in the Columbia watershed, where you had once the greatest, most productive salmon fishery on Earth, which is now just a little thread of its old self, uh, because of the uh, most ambitious hydropower development program in the history of the world, on which all of you up here depend to varying degrees. Um, it's almost come to the point where you have to decide between salmon and dams. Uh, the dams have fish ladders already. Uh, there are additional flows being released. About $200 million worth of hydropower is a potential hydropower is being sacrificed every year for the sake of fisheries. But the fishery is still in terrible shape no matter what the deputy director of the Bonneville Power Administration said to me a couple days ago in California, uh, the fishery is in bad shape. It's about 7% uh, of what it was turn of the century. So what will it take additionally to bring salmon back to some uh, level or some numbers that uh, we can you know, say uh, is I guess, uh, uh, what is the level that we can live with, that environmentalists and uh, consumers can say is, is uh, some kind of a, uh, how shall I put it, <clears throat> a decent uh, restitution for all that's been lost. That's, of course, a terrible quandary up here. In California, we have a quandary involving a place that hardly anybody knows about, or at least uh, has heard of, and that's the California Delta. Even Californians don't know exactly what the Delta is. And I want to tell you about this issue to make you feel a little bit better about uh, the difficulties you're going to face here continuing to address this Columbia problem. We have two big rivers in California. The two main rivers are the San Joaquin and the Sacramento rivers. And they drain the Sierra Nevada and about uh, 65 or 70 percent of all the runoff in the state comes down these two rivers. They meet just east of San Francisco in what used to be a sightless uh, marsh called the San Joaquin uh, Sacramento River Delta. It was about seven or 800,000 acres of uh, tule forest. It was basically a, a giant plain of uh, reedy marshes. And uh, in fact, it was such a confusing wilderness. It was a labyrinth of sloughs and things like that, that John C. Fremont, who called himself the Pathfinder, got lost in there for a couple of weeks before he found his way out. Um, the Delta was the first reclaimed agricultural area 
in post-Mission California. Uh, there was a guy, actually one person who started it all, a, fellow, a Dutchman named Zwart, who came here uh, to participate in the gold rush from Holland and failed, as most people did, and then decided, uh, since some of these people were making lots of money finding gold, he would just uh, provide the sustenance that the gold miners needed and wanted. So he grew melons on a little patch of uh, Delta land, about four acres worth. And in that first year of growing melons, he made more money since he was selling them for three to five dollars a piece in 1850 dollars, which translates to something like 150 dollars a piece today, which is what the Japanese pay for melons, I'm told. Um, he made more money than the President of the United States. He made $30,000 in 1850. Uh, the reason he made that money was not just because the gold miners had so much to spend or waste. They were spending uh, $20 a plate for oysters that were shipped down by schooner from Willapa Bay. But because the Delta proved to be such a marvelous uh, agricultural region, the Thules, over millions of years, had left behind uh, about a six-story frosting of pure humus soil that's essentially peat. And uh, when people realized how productive this land was and how you didn't have to build complex irrigation systems, you could simply run water by hose over one of these natural berms. There were, there were sloughs everywhere, and because of late snowpack melt, uh, there was fresh water coming down almost all year long, certainly in, well into the irrigation season. So it was basically an easy place to irrigate, which was not the case in most of California, certainly not Southern California. Uh, when people realized all this, they began farming the Delta. And by the 1860s, there were about 300,000 acres that were in production. Um, all of this was, of course, threatened by the kinds of uh, floods that would occasionally come down. In 1862, the Central Valley of California was a lake the size of Lake Ontario. It was about 30 miles wide and about 250 miles long. And it was all because of 75 inches of rain that fell over the course of about five weeks. Uh, very similar to the weather we just had this year. And of course, after that rain uh, had run its course, it dried up. So now we're back in drought conditions. These wild extremes in, in California's uh, precipitation have really steered the history of the state more than most of us realize. But in any event, um, the floods were a threat to Delta agriculture, which was so valuable, so productive, uh, by the 1860s that people began building levees. <clears throat> and as these levees went up, protecting the land, a strange thing was observed. Uh, nobody predicted this. They should have. As you farm peat, basically it oxidizes. It's so high in carbon content that the top two or three inches just volatilize every year. So when, when the delta was still a great big Thule marsh, that acted as a sort of a suffocating sunshade, and, and the soil was not directly exposed to the elements, and the floods brought new uh, sediments and nutrients down, and basically the place remained at sea level. But once it was cleared and it was intensively farmed, uh, it began to oxidize and it began to subside. So land that was at sea level in the California delta in about the 1850s was suddenly five or six feet below sea level by the end of that century. Today, there is one so-called island, and these are not really islands, these are bowls. These are empty reservoirs waiting to be inundated. Brandon Island is 22 feet below sea level. <clears throat> there are something like 30 of these islands that have been essentially reclaimed from this original uh, wilderness, Delta wilderness, that are all uh, very valuable agricultural producing areas, all of them ringed by levees, and these levees are in some cases the size of Mississippi River levees. And every one of these islands is from several feet to many feet below sea level. It's, in fact, uh, one of the preeminent below, inland below sea level areas in the world, very much like Holland. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem if it weren't for the fact that Southern California gets half of its water supply from Northern California, and that water goes through the Delta on its way south. It comes down the Sacramento River, it meanders through the Delta, 
There are about 350,000 horsepower worth of pumps at the southern end of the delta that then suck that water into the aqueducts that go 400 miles down and deliver water to Southern California. <clears throat> My feeling has always been that we Northern Californians ought to be giving water to Southern Californians in order to keep them where they are. Um, because you know what happens when they move up to where you are. The first thing they do is they look for the, a pristine hillside on which to put their 15 bedroom, gaudy, kitschy looking house. Um, and then of course they create a 20 acre lawn out of a desert and then they expect you to give them the water to irrigate it. Uh, so we don't like Southern Californians in Northern California any more than you like any Californians up here. Uh, so I've always been in favor of giving Californians, Southern Californians, some of our water, but not too much. In any event, uh, you have down there a city, uh, a region, an urban region of about 18 million people today. It's about six, seven times the size of Oregon. And you have a $450 billion economy, which is worth more than all of Africa, of the entire economic output of every African nation, including South Africa, does not match the economic productivity of metropolitan Los Angeles and San Diego. And all of that is dependent on water that comes from three sources. The first source being the Owens Valley, uh, that's the, the Chinatown story you're all familiar with. Uh, the second source being the Colorado River. And the third and most important source today being Northern California, uh, basically the Feather and Sacramento Rivers. You also have, even before you get to Los Angeles, the San Joaquin Valley, which is the richest agricultural region on Earth, producing about $12 billion worth of productivity. And that area gets about 65% of its water from Northern California through the Central Valley Project, biggest irrigation project in the world. Here you have these super engineered aqueducts, these monstrous expensive water projects, and yet you have this primitive old levied region that the water has to traverse in order to get to where it creates all this supposed good. Now, this region is below sea level, <clears throat> and the levees are protecting it. Uh, most of the time, there have been about 100 levee failures uh, in the last 75 or 80 years. There has never been a mass levee failure, and that's really what people are worried about. Uh, there are six major earthquakes within about, or earthquake faults within about 50 miles of the delta. And one of those faults in particular, the Hayward Fault, produced what were considered the great California earthquakes in the 19th century. One in 1836, another one in 1868. That one, the 1868 quake, destroyed much of Oakland and a good portion of San Francisco. Uh, that fault is capable of generating an earthquake to about 7.5 on the Richter scale. The 1906 quake was about an 8.3. Uh, were that to happen, uh, and I've, this is all part of a book that I'm writing now. I'm, I'm, I'm fictitiously demolishing California in a giant earthquake. Uh, it's giving me an immense amount of satisfaction, although <laughs> I know how, uh, how terrible I, uh, I think it's going to be. There's something in the, in the sort of abstract sense that makes it satisfying to me. Uh, so I'm staging a earth, an earthquake on this particular fault, the Hayward Fault, very similar to the fault that caused a $150 billion calamity in Kobe. In fact, striking parallels between Kobe and the East Bay, which is where the uh, Hayward Fault runs. What's different is that just beyond the East Bay, you have this delta region, about 400,000 acres below sea level, as much as 22 feet below sea level, a conduit for the most important water supply for Southern California, protected by levees that were built by Chinese labor and then built bigger and built bigger over the years, but are not in any sense well engineered. I've talked to at least a dozen geologists who believe that the largest credible earthquake on the Hayward Fault is going to cause a mass levee failure in the Delta. When that happens, San Francisco Bay is going to go inland. It's going to go all the way to Stockton and Sacramento. And you will have a huge brackish water sea sitting in the middle of California, right in the path of a water supply for a $450 billion economy and the most important agricultural region in America. 
there have been some computer models done that try to estimate what you do then and how long would it take. <clears throat> One of them that I've looked at basically estimates it's going to take three years before those pumps that supply Southern California can be turned back on because the water is going to be far too salty for consumption by humans or uh, lawn watering, which is where most of it goes down there, or <laughs> irrigation. <clears throat> now, imagine uh, a city like Portland or any city losing suddenly, just like that, 50% of its water supply. Imagine uh, the Willamette Valley losing 70% of its water supply, just like that, overnight. And then for three years, having to find water from somewhere else and not find it at all. That is at the heart of the Delta Dilemma, as we call it, California today. And we're trying to fix it in the same sense that you're trying to fix the Columbia River up here. Uh, we have created a, a, a program, it's called CalFed, it's basically an amalgamation of federal and state agencies, that is looking to spend anywhere from four to eight billion dollars fixing the Delta. How do you fix it? Well, that's, of course, the source of all the debate. Uh, one idea is to build an enormous canal, which used to be called a peripheral canal. Those of you familiar with California's water wars know that that's now a politically incorrect term you can't use anymore. A uh, peripheral canal would basically take the water from the Sacramento River and steer it around the delta in an earthquake-proof, immense concrete aqueduct that could carry about the capacity of the Willamette River at average flow a little bit less, and um, deliver it then to the aqueducts that already exist in Southern California. The fear is that that would, of course, starve the delta uh, and that whole ecosystem of the freshwater it needs. It's the most important freshwater, uh, brackish water estuary on the west coast of the Americas, not just North America, but South America. Uh, it's a really, despite its, uh, the, the uh, tremendous amount of uh, development uh, that is around the San Francisco Bay Area, six million people. Uh, this is still a very important ecosystem, at least to us. Uh, the Sacramento River used to be, I think, one of the five or six most productive salmon rivers in North America. Um, it wasn't like the Columbia, but there were a couple million, maybe even more, fish that came up in good years. There were 21 salmon canneries right before the turn of the century, just around San Francisco Bay, that were canning only the spring run which is one of the four runs of fish that come up. Uh, so we have a salmon fishery, that, a remnant salmon fishery, not as much of a remnant fishery as you have up here, but we do have one. And we have uh, a shad fishery, and we have a lot of species that have no commercial value but are uh, declining and uh, good candidates to join the endangered species list. Uh, and we have a lot of marsh habitat out there as well. So we have the same kind of conflict, a conflict between uh, human demands, economic productivity dependent on water, and a feeling that we ought to be restoring some of which we've lost uh, from the natural world. How can we continue uh, to sustain economic productivity, and how can we at the same time restore some of this lost natural fecundity. That's basically the dilemma that we're facing with both of these issues, the Columbia issue up here and, and the uh, Delta issue down there. Now, in California, it's complicated by this uh, mega disaster that could occur if there is a real uh, big earthquake and a mass inundation of the Delta. And uh, how that's going to be solved, I don't think anybody can tell. Uh, if you can't get the political support for the canal that goes around the delta, you're going to have to somehow fix what's there. You're going to have to build these levees stronger. You're going to have to build them better. Um, you're going to have to do something. Or alternatively, you're going to have to find Southern California a new source of water, which can only be the Colorado River or the Owens River. But right now, Los Angeles is the only big city, only huge city in the world that's actually losing its water supply. It's being forced to give Colorado River back to uh, other basin users, especially Arizona. It's being forced to cut its diversions from Mono Lake, which is part of the Owens Valley system, by about 85% each year. 
and it's actually putting water back into the Owens River for the first time in decades. So it's losing water from the other sources that could substitute for Northern California's water. I don't think we have any choice but to figure out how to continue to get them water in a way that is going to uh, not be utterly destructive of the ecosystem the water uh, goes through. Uh, how we do that, of course, is, is something nobody has an answer to. The good thing in, in California, and, and I'm going to close with this, is that we have in these water battles uh, that we've been all involved in for so many years, we've begun to stop demonizing each other. You know, when I was, uh, when I wrote Cadillac Desert, uh, I said some rather harsh things about uh, subsidizing big corporate farmers, uh, giving them water at about 10th the cost uh, that it cost the taxpayers to deliver the water. And uh, I said some very nasty things about Los Angeles. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, an immediate target uh, to people who thought we ought to be building a couple of dams a week. Uh, it got, I got, uh, I think I was so disliked in the San Joaquin Valley that I actually had a t-shirt made. Um, somebody stenciled it for me. And this is right after Salman Rushdie had a fatwa put out on him uh, because of his remarks about Islam. Uh, the t-shirt said on the back, hi, I'm Salman Rushdie. Uh, so I wouldn't be mistaken for Mark Reisner on my travels through the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, the t-shirt is actually in tatters. I'm going to have a new one made. But I've managed now to, to make peace with uh, some of my erstwhile enemies, and uh, in fact, quite a few of them. The, uh, we have a so-called three-way process going on where the, the three big stakeholders in these battles, the environmental community, the urban water agencies and the agricultural, the irrigated agricultural interests are all actually sitting down at the table on a, almost on a monthly or even weekly basis and hashing these things out. And once you get to know each other, you know, you realize that most people are fundamentally decent and mean well and we're not devils and demons and we don't have horns. Uh, so the demonization is a thing of the past. Uh, I don't know whether you've come quite that far up here in the Columbia battles. Whenever I read some publication out of here, it always manages to demonize somebody. Um, but I would submit to you that the only way that you can ever solve problems that are this big, this intractable, and this expensive is to figure out a solution that most people can live with most of the time. You can't please everybody all of the time. Uh, and it's going to be a practical, not an ideologically driven solution, and it's going to be an imaginative solution. Uh, it's going to be hard-headed in its practicality. Um, I think that what, may, what you may learn up here is that there's only so much tinkering you can do with the Columbia River. You can only let so much water pass uh, bypass the uh, hydroelectric turbines for the sake of fisheries flows. Uh, there's only so much you can do to fine tune your fish ladders. Uh, maybe you can take some dams down. I don't know. I know there's now halfway serious talk about taking a couple, a few of the Snake River dams down. Those will be the biggest dams we've ever taken down in this country solely for the sake of fisheries restoration. Uh, I'm involved in a, a little effort to take down four little dams on a, a tiny tributary of the Sacramento River that happens to be a pretty significant salmon producer. It's called Butte Creek. And those dams are actually going to come down next year. Four little dams, diversion dams about eight or ten feet high. The Metropolitan Water District uh, is paying one-third of the cost of this ten million dollar project because they are terrified of a uh, listing of the spring-run Chinook salmon, which would seriously affect their ability to divert water. Uh, but in any event, it may be possible that you can take other dams down on other rivers that are not Columbia uh, tributaries uh, as a sort of a quid pro quo. We've done this in the case of air pollution where we've transferred development rights. Uh, we've done it in the case of, uh, especially in Los Angeles, where, where basically a right to pollute is being traded, bought and sold all over the basin uh, the end result is minimization of pollution in the areas that count. Uh, this is, you know, not the 
solution that the environmentalists would necessarily have in mind, but it's one driven largely by market forces, and it's one that makes a lot of pragmatic sense. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, Californians and Northwesterners do have this one thing in common. They may not like to admit it. Each of us, each region, faces a natural resources issue that is probably more complex than anything anybody else faces in the rest of this country. Uh, I think, fortunately, we have the, the interest, the dedication, the intelligence, and the practicality to come to a solution that's pretty good. I don't know whether we can hope for more than anything like that. Thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Mark, for a talk of import to, to all of us, including Oregonians and Californians. In your talk on water supply, you mentioned um, a number of grandiose themes in the past or ways to bring water down, and one you mentioned was floating the icebergs and also the aqueduct. One you didn't mention um, was one that I did a research paper on a long time ago in college on desalinization of seawater. And Scientists at that time said advances in technology were eventually going to make the desert bloom in, in Western America, and obviously that hasn't happened. I'm not interested in hearing about desalinization of seawater. What I am interested in hearing is how much of a continuing problem is this issue of relying on the false hope of technology to solve problems and, as a result, deferring decisions on the hope that that's going to happen and it, and it doesn't. Well, that's a good question, Don. Um, I think that desalinization is a lot like fusion energy. You know, the, the, the knock on fusion energy is that it's about 10 years away and always will be 10 years away. <laughs> uh, desalinization is, uh, you know, probably a, an intelligent choice in places that have tremendous amounts of cheap oil and no sources of water. So in Saudi Arabia, it makes a lot of sense to build desalinization plants, and they do have the largest one in the world, I think. Uh, in California, I would say it makes absolutely no sense, uh, except for a few isolated coastal communities like Santa Barbara, and they, in fact, uh, were so traumatized by the five-year drought we had in the late 80s that they were actually spray painting their lawns green. They didn't have the water to irrigate them, so some people are actually out there spray painting their lawns green. Uh, they then built a desalinization plant, and they are, uh, it's been operating intermittently. It's a modular plant. The cost of the water is about $2,000 per acre foot. <clears throat> now, an acre foot is what, uh, you know, a fairly indulgent California family uses in the course of a year. Uh, I think the average family income in California is about 30000 bucks, so they'd be spending about 8% of their income on water alone. And that's just from the plant. Then you have the distribution costs, and those drive the, the end cost up to about $2,600 or $2,700 an acre foot. Uh, the cost of conservation, uh, of more aggressive conservation, is much cheaper than desalinization. The cost of reclaiming wastewater, basically taking sewage water and treating it with reverse osmosis, to the point where you can at least use it to water lawns, public golf courses and things like that, which are big water consumers in California. Uh, that makes better sense. Uh, it may even be possible that towing water from uh, British Columbia in these giant sacks, which is the latest thing that I've heard about, makes more sense than uh, uh, desalinization. I think the, uh, the bloom is off the rose when it comes to technological fixes. Uh, I think the same as uh, what's happening in the energy sector is pretty much what's going to happen in the water sector. We've given up on nuclear power that's too cheap to meter. We've given up on you know, hydrogen energy and things like that, at least any time soon. And uh, you know, to pursue these holy grails costs billions and billions of dollars and doesn't necessarily yield any results. So I think the, the practical uh, soft path is, if you will, um, a term that Amory Levin's coined, is what's informing us nowadays, and I think it's going to for the foreseeable future. Um, 
Could you tell us a little bit about uh, Mono Lake and specifically about the selenium? And I'm particularly interested in the public trust doctrine and how it was applied and how you see it working and whether or not it has any ramifications for us up here in the Northwest. I could try. Uh, Mono Lake, or briefly for background, is a huge saline lake, uh, one of the last of several that used to exist in the eastern Sierra Nevada. They were in closed basins where there's no outlet, and you have snow melt feeding these big uh, bodies of water, and uh, the evaporation rates are high, so Mono Lake is about twice as salty as the ocean. It's fed by five uh, little streams that occasionally do gush, and uh, you know when Los Angeles sees flowing water, it can't stand the sight of it, or at least it has to flow some other direction, namely toward itself. Uh, they went up in the 40s, diverted the major streams feeding Mono Lake, have been doing that ever since, have lowered the lake level by something like 50 feet, um, and has, have in increased the salinity concentration to the point where all the wildlife, and a surprising amount of wildlife does depend on this lake, uh, have begun to disappear. There was a, a famous uh, legal decision, I think it was 1983, uh, the Audubon Society was lead plaintiff, where Mono Lake was ruled a public trust asset, something that really belongs to all Californians, not just Los Angeles, and uh, that its value was much greater than a potential water supply. And Los Angeles was, in effect, forced to curtail its diversions by about 85% from Mono Lake. That is the one clear-cut public trust victory that I know about. Uh, but there, especially in California, has been an awful lot of talk about applying public trust doctrine to other precious, irreplaceable natural assets. Now, there's, I don't see any difference between the Columbia River and Mono Lake. I don't see why applying that same judicial logic, you couldn't say the greatest salmon river that ever was on Earth uh, is the Columbia. And uh, it was manipulated to the point now where uh, the overwhelmingly predominant use is hydroelectricity generation. Uh, and this, in essence, stole an incalculably important natural asset from uh, Northwesterners from the world citizens at large. And uh, the situation today is just untenable. Something is going to have to be done. Uh, the problem is political. When you have you know, 20,000 odd megawatts of hydroelectric power being generated from a system like that, and all of you are paying uh, electricity rates that are about a third of the natural or national average, uh, how much are you willing to pay more? What are you willing to sacrifice and give up in the sense of comfort, convenience, and uh, low-cost electricity to restore this system. Um, I don't know how far the courts are going to go with it, uh, but I think it was surprising to a lot of people that they went as far as they did with Mono Lake. Thay Jensen, member. Uh, I know after you wrote uh, Cadillac Desert, you co-authored with some others, as I recall, another book, and I, I believe it was called something like Overtapping the Oasis, a call for uh, a massive reform of water law throughout the western United States, which you obviously uh, saw at that time, at least as being a, a solution to what you saw as a coming problem. And there's no question uh, that it is. And as we see more and more Americans moving south, and you've seen what's happened in Las Vegas, where essentially the demand for, for water in that city and its, its exponential growth pits them against agricultural interests. At the same time, we have an incredibly valuable American agricultural industry, one that has enriched our lives and the lives of millions throughout the world. And I'm wondering to what extent you still see uh, the need for water law reform as being an important part of the solution and whether or not you, you still see it as, as being really the, the largest uh, component of a solution to this coming problem. Well, it's a good question. I, I wrote that book uh, with a lawyer so I could hide behind her, pretending I knew something about water law when I really don't. Uh, briefly, we have, again in California, I hate to harp on California, but we have passed a law. Uh, the Central Valley Project Improvement Act applies to the biggest irrigation project in, in the West. And this law is basically a set of legal reforms, besides establishing some uh, fish and wildlife restoration goals, habitat restoration goals. It now treats water 
much more as a free commodity, as a marketable commodity than it was. It used to be illegal for any CVP farmer to sell his water outside the CVP service area. That's the Central Valley. The demand, of course, is elsewhere, Southern California, San Jose, Contra Costa. Uh, so the water was, was prohibited from going to where the demand for the water was. Uh, that is now ended. You can sell water. But the obverse of that problem is that water does flow uphill toward power and money. And if you let that happen in a kind of an unfettered manner, you're going to get Los Angeles again and again and again. Phoenix is going to be Los Angeles. Denver is going to be Los Angeles, maybe even Portland. So how do you prevent that? How, how do you prevent the free market uh, in water from creating these urban nightmares in deserts where arguably they shouldn't be? Uh, one partial solution is to limit the amount of water that can be transferred from any given water district, and the CVPI does that too. It essentially says that any CVP contracting water district can export 20% of its water, and that's that. That's the end. That way, farmers can make money selling water, and with the profits, they can invest in efficient irrigation, in theory, and they can shift from low value to higher value crops that use less water. And maybe most of the acreage in that district will continue to produce and the whole rural economy will remain intact. Uh, and you'll be sending some water to the urban areas, but not too much. I think that is uh, you know, the kind of thinking that I was advocating, the kind of policy I was advocating in Overtaft Oasis. It's happened in the case of CVPIA. Uh, in other states, though, for example, especially Colorado, you have basically an unfettered market in water. And the result of that is that, according to population projections, the, Denver, the new Denver airport, which is now sitting in the middle of wheat fields and corn fields, is about to be, about to be meaning in another 25 years, the center of a new city the size of current Denver. And it's only happening because water is being sucked in from agricultural regions all around through these kinds of unfettered market mechanisms. Randy Strode, City Club member. Um, you outlined a scenario of uh, possibly three years where LA and other uh, parts of California could be without water for uh, the Delta, from the Delta. Um, any Portland resident who has a good imagination and has seen where Bull Run Reservoir water crosses the Sandy River can clearly identify with that kind of scenario. How prevalent is that kind of situation in uh, Western communities where there's an Achilles heel in their water supply? Well, I can't speak for this area. I know that there's a major thrust fault zone right offshore and that one of these days you're going to get an earthquake up here that may beggar the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. Um, and you're certainly not prepared for it as well as we are with our earthquake history in California. But whether the water supply at uh, Bull Run could be disrupted by some catastrophic event like that, I can't say. I just met the new water commissioner here. Maybe he has an answer. Roger Bachman, member. I wanted to beat Dan Goldie and, and Ray Polani to the mic today. <laughs> if I recall from your book, Cadillac Desert, which I read some years ago, there is at the mouth of the, or, uh, of the Colorado River a desalination plant to remove the salt, according to a treaty with Mexico, the salt coming from irrigated fields. And I think you pointed out how much cheaper it would be to buy up those farms that are producing the salt instead of running a desalination plant. Is that still going on, and who's paying for it? Well, this is a wonderful example of the sort of old style of thinking versus the new style. Uh, the Colorado River is used so often that I think the average molecule of water has passed through 13 sets of kidneys, whether they be human kidneys, <laughs> cow kidneys, sheep kidneys, or some other kidneys, before it hits Mexico. So you have uh, salinity that uh, you know, is 600 parts per million somewhere up around Lake Powell, and by the time it hits the Mexican border, it's, it's over 800. When you get up to that range, it becomes difficult to irrigate, and the most, most important 
irrigated, the most important farm region in all of Mexico is around Mexicali, just south of the border, dependent on, en entirely dependent on Colorado River water. So as a part of our treaty obligation, uh, and especially when Mexico discovered that it was sitting on a huge reserve of oil, which gave it a political counterweight, or mace to wield against us, uh, we began trying to figure out how to uh, reduce the salinity uh, concentrations in the river before entering Mexico. Uh, a number of people, economists especially, uh, were saying, look, you have some irrigated areas, little tiny ones, up there in the Piance Basin, for example, in western Colorado, where they take water out and it's 200 parts per million salinity and the tail water they put back into the river is 6,000. Uh, these are not very valuable agricultural areas, so why don't you just pay a lot of money to these farmers, uh, enough so they can buy a big Winnebago and retire in Florida, uh, to go out of business so that you don't have this tremendous isolated contamination problem that contributes very disproportionately to the river flow. Well, of course, every member of Congress from that region said, over my dead body, the same way they're saying over my dead body when you talk about tearing down Snake River dams. Uh, the result was the Yuma desalinization plant, which is the largest desalinization plant, uh, I think, in the Western Hemisphere, if not the world, uh, projected to cost $200 million, actually cost close to $400 million, and projected to operate, which it does not. Uh, it is the largest inoperational desalinization plant in the world. So it was bad enough that we were going to spend uh, several hundred dollars per acre foot uh, to desalinate water so that upriver irrigators could continue to irrigate with subsidized water that they bought for $3.50 per acre foot. That was the plan, and that was dumb enough. But we, we also managed to build a plant that doesn't work. So there's a $400 million white elephant sitting out there at Yuma on the Colorado River, and nobody knows what the hell to do with it. That is an example of the old style of thinking in, in Western water policy. I don't know how we're going to solve that problem, uh, but Mexico is going to hold our nose to the fire, or our feet to the fire, and force us one way or the other to solve it. That's it? <laughs> no more? No, not even a criticism. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure to be here. Well, I know I speak for all of you in thanking uh, Mark for his provocative remarks. We really are glad that you came here from California. We are very glad you're going home, but we invite you to come back again soon. Thank you. We stand adjourned.